Hi, everybody. Um, so, yeah, this, this presentation is about um, my experience connecting IPv6 Enterprise Islands at CETA, um, so a global aviation service provider. Um, but before we get there, um, a little bit about me for those who don't know me. Um, I'm currently one of the lead infrastructure architects at the BBC, um, so I look after some of the networking functions and design there. But previously, um, I was a principal architect at one of the alt-nets in the UK, um, worked for CETA in global aviation service provider sector um, as a lead security architect, um, and that's the work there is what this presentation is about. And uh, as Tim mentioned prior to that, was at the University of Reading um, as head of IT operations there. My V6 credentials, um, I've been designing and building V6 networks since around 2008, um, including so far three production network deployments um, in two different countries. I do have to caveat this, none of what is presented here is affiliated with the BBC or anything to do with the BBC. This is all entirely my own personal opinions, my own work, and based on experience at CETA, not the BBC. So, Based on CETA's network, it's a global company, so multiple physical locations globally. Three of them were core sites. So for anybody working in global companies, this is probably quite a familiar setup. Some sites have their own direct internet access. Um, others are satellites that either have a WAN um, provided by a managed service provider or have a mix of direct internet access and a global WAN connection. But the WAN provider in question either won't support V6 in certain countries, or wants to charge us a very, very large fee to enable it. Um, we're talking six figures here to enable this. Um, the nice bit, though, was our global IT department said we're free to enable IPv6 at any site in any order, just make it happen basically, which was good. So, the three core sites were acting as regional internet gateways, so for sites that don't have direct internet connectivity, all the traffic is routed via the three regional gateways. We have 25 sites that have um, local internet breakout with the WAN connectivity as well. Three that are internet access only, um, so this was our newer deployment model at the time. The idea was eventually we'd get rid of the WAN and do an SD-WAN overlay or something similar. And then there were 65 sites that only had the WAN connectivity. So these were small regional offices or maybe sites at airports, this type of thing. So very, very different connectivity styles and very, very different sort of designs for the network at this point. So the core sites, um, these are the quite easy ones to do. Um, they're fairly standard, so we took IPv6 natively from our ISPs. Um, we were in the lucky position that we had a slash eight of V4 space. Don't, uh, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, we have start, yes, they had started selling bits off before, before I moved on from there. Um, so we also had a corresponding slash 29 of V6 space. Um, so we, we, we were in quite a good position. We were running BGP at the internet edge, um, and then typical enterprise environment, OSPF v3, layer three switches. Um, we enabled the server segments as some of the first things that were done, and we enabled v6 on the VPN endpoints. One of the reasons we did the regional gateways and the core sites first is it gave us, gave us the biggest win earliest on because it meant all our VPN connectivity was v6 enabled at that point. So anybody sat at home, was dual stack connected, which also helped us from a security perspective because it meant we had all of the traffic being inspected by next-gen firewalls and other security appliances, and we weren't bypassing 40% of the traffic around the security appliances because it was V6. So color-coded on the diagram there, um, the stuff in green, which is the, the, the typical perimeter routers, firewalls, layer three switches, that's all V6 enabled. And the stuff in red, which is to do with our WAN connectivity, we can't touch that, unfortunately. But it's good enough for, for this point in our deployment. 
but we've got three core sites. So we need to somehow join those across the WAN that we're not going to pay to have v6 enabled on. So we did something a bit nasty. We used GRE tunnels. Um, but it works. It works. And at this point, it's a case of we just need something that we can put in that is supportable by the network team. They understand it. It works. So we put GRE tunnels in between the three sites. Um, so this wraps an IPv6 packet inside a V4 packet, allows us to send it over the V4-only WAN. We used um, ISIS for dynamic routing. Because we already had OSPF v3 running as the IGP in the regional gateway, we needed something else for dynamic routing. And we didn't want to pay for the BGP licenses on the switches. So we used ISIS. It works fine. And then we export filtered routes um, in both directions, so between OSPF v3 and ISIS and back again. And the key thing here is the routes from ISIS to v3 were exported as external type 2, which meant we could just filter all type 2 routes. It's like we don't, we don't care. We don't want to input, export those back into ISIS. So that worked really well for us. Um, everything came up. Everything worked second time, not first time, but it was good enough. And that meant that we had the three core sites able to talk to each other, servers could communicate natively over v6 without going out to the internet and back in again. Um, so we're in a quite, quite a good place at this point. And that is the topology we ended up with for the three core sites. So the orange arrows in the, or orange blobs in the middle are the GRE tunnels between the sites. Just so everybody's clear where we are with those. So in terms of getting routes in and out, because this is something that's always a challenge in international environments, um, we decided to split each region to have a slash 40 allocation. Um, we advertised the slash 40 out to the internet providers with eBGP, and then advertised the default route back in to OSPF v3 for each hub. We then advertised the slash 48 from, um, for the hub itself into the tunnel endpoints, and then redistributed that into ISIS. So you can see how the routing data gets between the three sites. And then finally, um, all the 48s coming in from the other site to be advertised back into OSPF v3, so we've got the bi-directional paths there. The internet-only branches, um, so these were the three offices that then we were intending to expand to, to be the default way of connecting branch offices. This was a quick win for us. Um, it's really easy. We add v6 to the existing IPsec tunnels that we had going back to the hub sites. We were already doing BGP across those IPsec tunnels, so we just added the v6 um, address family to it. And we had a preferred and non-preferred path, so we were just using AS path prepend to make that happen. And you've got the, the diagram at the bottom to show that. Um, on these diagrams, what I've done, just, just for clarity, the blue is native v6, the orange is tunneled in some variety, so in this case, IPsec. But now we start getting some challenges. Um, we have a WAN-only branch. For these, um, we can't touch the CE router, so this is the, supposedly the customer side, because we don't run it. This was provided as a managed service by the WAN provider, so we were in a slightly unusual position where the WAN provider was doing both the PE and CE router for us, and we couldn't get config changes made on the CE routers. We need to have dynamic routing, but the layer three switch we have on site doesn't do BGP, um, because these were quite old Cisco Catalyst devices, and doesn't do ISIS, because these were quite old Cisco Catalyst devices. Um, we don't want to run RIPNG, because anything RIP is generally bad, um, for lots of reasons. Um, and it's bad practice to extend OSPF v3 across WAN links, because of the high latency and convergence time issues and all that sort of stuff. Bearing in mind, some of these sites were quite some distance from their regional hub in terms of round trip. So 
I think the furthest one was somewhere in the middle of Africa. It was about 180, 200 milliseconds round trip to get there. So, again, GRE to the rescue. Um, we created GRE tunnels from the sites layer three switch to two of the regional core sites, so we had the resilience there. We then reverted to static routes, um, to default going outbound plus BFD, because that gives us the rapid fault detection. And then the static inbound route coming back from the regional hub to the, the, the WAN only branch. Export that into SPF v3, and then that's redistributed between the three gateways, three regional gateways, and that all worked fine. And that's roughly what this looked like. So on the left, we have the branch site, we have the layer three switch, we have the, the CE, we have a GRE tunnel to the tunnel endpoints um, in the regional gateways, and then native V6 from there on out to the internet. Which is what I've just explained there. Um, hopefully that's all good for everybody so far. Yep, cool. For the sites that had the WAN plus local internet breakout, we've got another couple of challenges. Um, so the first one is we wanted the default route, obviously, to be via the local internet breakout, but with a backup going to the WAN. And we wanted all the intra-company com traffic to stick to the WAN and not go out to the internet and back in because that makes firewalling a bit of a pain. It also means if stuff's inadvertently going over the internet, there may be privacy concerns where some of the stuff may not be encrypted that perhaps should be if it's going over a public network. And again, we can't change the CE router config because again, it's a managed service. So what we ended up doing for this one, um, or the intent was, on the left to have native v6 um, out to the internet via the local DIA. We had the tunnel in the middle to the regional site and then um, native v6 from the tunnel endpoint back in. We advertised the site slash 48 in BGP out to the internet provider um, and the default route into the site with OSPF v3. We added a default route with a high admin distance statically to that layer three switch in the middle. Um, so that meant that the route via the ISP was preferred for default. But then we also had to have the slash 38 supernet that we designed for enterprise use advertised that way as well. Static route from the um, regional gateway back in. But then the magic is we're advertising the slash 48 into the regional hub and the slash 40 out in BGP. So because we had the 48 on the direct circuit and the 40 on the regional circuit, it meant the direct circuit on the local site was preferred, because obviously longest path. Um, I'm not sorry, longest prefix. Um, but then we ended up being able to fail over if that circuit went down for whatever reason to the slash 40 route um, being summarized and sent out the regional gateway. And that actually worked quite well for us. We had a couple of instances where we lost ISPs for whatever reason and everything just failed over as it should do. So, for the internet access, let's try and bring this all together and then see if we can spot some issues with the way we're doing things. So the first thing is internet access is actually quite easy. Um, the paths are what you'd expect. So on the left, we've got the internet only times three sites, direct internet access out, easy. Mo most people can sort that one. In the middle, we've got the three regional gateways, again, out via their local connections. Um, second right, we've got the internet breakout and WAN sites, again, preferred DIA. And then for the WAN only, it's via whichever of the th three regional gateways is the nearest. For accessing a central resource, um, this is usually fine. Um, so I, I've pretended that the internet only sites are connected to the America's regional gateway, just to keep the diagram easy. Um, so from there, out to the internet, over IPSEC, back in, up to wherever the central resource is, that's fine. Um, that's the type of route we want. And then from the sites with their own WAN connections, just across the WAN in the GRE tunnels, that's fine. All happy, all good. But we have a problem. 
at this point. If one of the WAN only sites um, is trying to get to a resource that is not connected to the regional gateways it's connected to, the traffic first goes to its preferred regional gateway, then it has to hop between them, and then potentially again to get to the site where the resource trying to be accessed is. So this is adding some potentially quite large round trip time hops to the network path. But wasn't really a problem for us, and I'll explain why in a sec. But first thing I want to co cover a couple of lessons that we learned before I get onto the suboptimal routing. I really should have done this slide the other way around. Um, so on the suboptimal routing, the traffic analysis we had was 90% of the traffic was to and from the internet. So the previous scenario that I gave here was less than 10% of our traffic. And it was really only things like the occasional file transfer or a point-to-point -point Teams call. And Teams was actually quite smart because it was realizing if it sent the media through an internet gateway, it would get a better response time. So it was flipping over to using the internet gateways for Teams. So that was quite cool. So that wasn't really a problem. What we did find, though, was the 24 byte overhead for GRE um, caught us out on things that weren't doing path MTU discovery properly. But we did find that if we advertised the optimal M MTU in the RAs that we were sending out on site, that fixed the MTU problem for the devices that weren't doing path MTU discovery properly, which I have to say were mainly embedded and, and IoT things, so they're not sort of users' desktops or anything like that. We also found that it was potentially possible to do malicious attacks against some of the WAN bandwidth. So some of the sites that we're talking about were connected at one and a half, two meg. It's quite easy to generate that amount of traffic as an ICMP flood and just flood that WAN link if you knew the addressing. We mitigated this by putting security, security controls at the perimeter, so just turning on DOS protection, turning on ICMP, UDP flood protection, that type of thing, just to keep that traffic down. <coughs> I got through that in record time. Any questions? I'm sure there are. Great. <laughs> <laughs> ooh, so, Jen. ooh. Jen's got a question. We should go further. No, let's not. <laughs> Thank you. A uh, question you mentioned MTU problem, right? Mm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, advertising lowered MTU in array help hosts not to send too much outside. Did you see many problems with internet servers? No. So it's like for you, it's like mostly TCP or quick, right? I guess yes. there is yeah. no like DNS radius for God's sake. So, so DNS, um, DNS was on site. We ran an anycast pool okay. and we had a DNS resolver on every single site. Um, so that was fine. Radius wasn't a problem because at the time we were not running .1x or anything like that. Um, okay, I see. They, they are now, but at the time we weren't. So, um, but again, the as mentioned in the previous presentation, the management of the devices was all v4 because again, legacy devices, legacy cloud services, this type of thing. Mm, okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else or Jen to throw to? Okay, if not, then thank you very much, Andy.